Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome once again. Today, thanks to the very good people who support me on Patreon, people like you, Aaron Mastriani, I am getting to talk about something very, very different. This is not a spy movie. Of course, it stars an actor who would go on to play one of the most famous spies in cinema history, but this movie is a little bit of an oddball, and uh, I, well, I'll, I'll get into more about why I'm excited to be talking about The Man Who Haunted Himself later on, but first, um, let's talk a little bit about how this particular film came to be. It's based on a novel, The Strange Case of Mr. Pelham by Anthony Armstrong. The plot concerns a man named Pelham becoming involved in a car accident, and once he recovers, comes to realise that there is an exact double of himself slowly taking over his life. The story had previously been adapted into an episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents in 1955, known as The Case of Mr. Pelham. This version of the story stars Tom Ewell, and despite being a much abbreviated version of the story, is still pretty swell in one of my favourite episodes of that series. Fifteen years later, the story is once again adapted, this time into The Man Who Haunted Himself, a much more sensationalist title, and I much prefer The Strange Case of Mr. Pelham myself. Uh, this version of the story is directed by Basil Dearden, and stars a pre-007 Roger Moore as Harold Pelham, and much like the source material, we open the story with Pelham becoming involved in a car accident. Exactly how this happens is left somewhat ambiguous. We see Pelham leaving work, very proper looking and serious, to some jaunty title music, and even though it's without dialogue, the way Pelham is checking the time, the way he's sitting, the car he drives, it tells us a lot about his character. This is a very straight-laced fellow, which makes it very odd when something seems to come over him on his drive and he unbuckles his seatbelt and starts driving recklessly, imagining himself in a sports car. He loses control and crashes, technically dies for a few seconds before being resuscitated. During this time, something happens, and now as Pelham returns to his daily life, it becomes clear that there is someone or something else living as him. There's lots of instances of various people coming up to Pelham and saying things like, oh, it was great to see you at dinner last night, to which Pelham reacts with confusion, and these scenes make up much of the bulk of the middle of the film, escalating the tension each time, with Pelham getting closer and closer to meeting his double. Meanwhile, we have a drama playing out between Pelham and his wife, played by Hildegard Neal. Pelham is somewhat impotent, and his wife is growing frustrated by the somewhat boring lives the pair lead together. And these are some of the best scenes in the film, for my reckoning, uh, watching the pair squabble. They feel like such a real domestic couple. The pair have such a great chemistry, and they're talking so frankly about the state of their relationship. Sometimes it's touching, sometimes it's amusing, but... I could quite happily watch the pair of them bicker about their dinner plans for a good two hours. You're just grumpy, that's all, and I'm going to get you something to eat. I honestly don't want anything. Well, you'll have to go down and dispose of the pasta. And don't make a noise, otherwise they'll come out and investigate. Look, if I can't chuck some spaghetti down the bloody sink in my own house, I'm going to emigrate. As the film goes on, we get to hear more and more about the far more exciting double of Pelham, and we come to realise that Pelham's wife and friends all seem to pretty much prefer his other entity. The film has some great set pieces, particularly a scene in which Pelham rushes around his club, narrowly missing his supposed double time and time again. Eagle-eyed Bond fans might recognise the location here as being the same place that Bond and Gustav Graves have their sword fight in, Dine of the Day. At one point, Moore's character even mentions James Bond by name, which is pretty neat. I geeked out a little bit. How could it happen, Pearl? Come on, Charles, espionage isn't all James Bond and the Majesty's Secret Service. Industry goes in for it too, you know. From this point on, I'm going to be dealing in some major spoilers for the film, so if you haven't seen the film, I highly recommend stopping this review right here, going and finding the film somewhere on DVD or Blu-ray or some kind of streaming service, watching it, and then coming back and watching the rest of this review, because... I don't feel, I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't already seen it, but there is a lot that I want to talk about, about the revelations in the second half of the movie. So, disclaimer out of the way, I find it interesting that the film does show us Pelham's double in scenes throughout the film before Pelham himself comes face to face with 
himself, if that makes any sense. And I guess it's open to interpretation whether Pelham is going mad or if he has a split personality or indeed if there is a physical double of Pelham until close to the very end when we see that there is indeed a second Pelham, prompting some terrific acting from Roger Moore playing both parts superbly. It's a shame that some of the visual effects are a bit hokey, especially when you compare it to the Alfred Hitchcock Presents episode, which included a similar scene and looks a whole lot better. I know these kinds of effects are less noticeable in black and white, but learning from the commentary that The Man Who Haunted Himself was a somewhat cheaply produced film, uh, the shoddy effects aren't terribly surprising. I mean, the sets look fine, but you could have just told me that this was filmed for TV rather than a theatrical release, and I wouldn't have questioned it. There's just something very TV about the look of the film. For a thriller like this, I would have appreciated some more atmospheric cinematography and consistent colour palette. And I know that the colour is an odd thing to gripe about, but there are some odd flourishes throughout the film that I'm not sure if are deliberate or maybe everyone in 1970 had fluorescent towels like that. While I'm talking about criticisms, I also think the script gives too much time to Pelham's work colleagues and this whole company merger thing that's going on. I know that a big reason why Pelham's life is a bit crappy is because he's spending too much time at work and not with his family, but I don't think we need some of these extended boardroom scenes. They just get a little dull. One of my favourite aspects of the film, though, is how much is left ambiguous and open to interpretation. There is definitely a supernatural element to what we see, and no detail is really given as to how this second Pelham came to exist. At a point, the real Pelham visits a psychiatrist who gives some lip service to how different aspects of personality exist within people and so on, and I suppose that we're to believe that a certain aspect of Pelham's personality that he had been somewhat suppressing had taken life here. The funny thing is that people seem to actually much prefer the wilder, looser Pelham, making the scene where Pelham confronts himself extra uncomfortable. His wife is there, and while it is left ambiguous, my interpretation is that she fully knows who her real husband is, but maybe she sees this as a way out of the incredibly dull life she's living, uh, but it's not made clear, and that level of ambiguity is one of my favourite things about the film. I certainly don't need a scene where we find out that Pelham had like a curse put on him decades ago when he was a child by some disgruntled old gypsy woman. I, I This is a fantasy, and we don't need to operate in that kind of logic. Things happen, and that's just fine. But... I'm Calvin Dyson. And nothing is more ambiguous than the very ending of the film. The evil Pelham is chasing the good one, and everything becomes quite abstract with the lighting and various flashes of characters from throughout the film appearing, and we get an exceptionally good evil cackle from Moore here too. <laughs> Anyway, the good Pelham is driven off the road and into a river by the evil one, but just before the car hits the water, he disappears. And then the evil Pelham grabs his chest and, given the upbeat music and the way Roger portrays it, it implies to me that the good Pelham has somehow taken control over the evil vessel of Pelham, and I'm not sure why that happens, but it does, and I mean, hey, it's ambiguous and I like that, and I didn't need an extra scene where the psychiatrist comes in to explain everything. If you're looking for a perfectly clear, tight thriller plot that answers all the questions it proposes, this is not really going to work on that level. Where I think the film excels is with its cast and its themes. I love it when it goes a little bit more surreal and kind of nightmarish, and indeed there is this whole kind of nightmare, dreamlike feel to the movie, and not necessarily all dreams and nightmares make 100% logical sense. They'd be very boring if they did. But the standout element of the movie is without a doubt Roger Moore himself. This is certainly the best performance I've ever seen him give, and he said himself that this was actually his favourite part to play. The scene where he talks to his double over the phone is just heartbreaking. It's a very understated and human performance, and shows what Roger was capable of 
as an actor. Certainly being as good looking and charming as Moore was, he was inevitably cast in, you know, cavalier hero types, and here he's playing a very unflashy, everyman kind of part, but it doesn't feel jarring or weird at all watching him in this role. I, I think he really excels in it. If you're a Roger Moore fan, you need to see this film. It's essential viewing if you wish to see him at his very best. I also just feel like it's necessary to pay respects to the great man's memory. He really loved this part and he was very proud of this film and would speak about it fondly in interviews and in his books and such. And in the mid 2000s, he even brought up the idea of a potential sequel in the film's audio commentary. I'd like to go back and uh, actually make a thought about it, doing a sequel to this. Today, 30 years later, sort of what happened, which was the Pelham that survived? Was he the good or the evil one? Or what happened to the boys when they grew up? He was a big champion of the film years after it was released, and it was certainly through his expression of fondness for it that I sought it out, and despite not being terribly well received critically or commercially in its time, The Man Who Haunted Himself is now readily available on DVD and Blu-ray in many places, and while I wouldn't describe it as a thriller for the ages, it features a great actor giving a terrific on-screen performance, explores interesting themes, and has such a great nightmarish quality to its presentation, it comes highly recommended from me. Thanks, Thanks for- uh, oh. No, it's my bad. No, 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 sorry. I... No, R no really. No, 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 I insist. You first. Ah, okay then. Well, thanks for watching, Bond fans, and uh, if you would like to find out more details about next month's Patreon poll, then please do head over to my Patreon page. Yes, and always, please feel free to leave me a comment below telling me what your thoughts are on the movie. I'd be really curious to hear more about it. It's not a movie that one often gets to discuss that much, uh, and please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and feel free to check out my Facebook and Twitter pages. And until next time, Bond fans... So long for now, Bond fans!